Do you have trouble, you've studied for an exam, you're ready to take the exam, but sometimes you have trouble understanding the questions or there may be two or three answers that are correct and picking. Sometimes you just need help with test taking strategies. You've reviewed, you're ready for to take the exam, but you'd like to take some practice questions that have rationale that explain to you why this is the better answer than others. Well, hi, this is Cammie Christie. I have a deal for you. Join me with MedEd and get some practice examinations with rationale so that you can better prepare yourself to take the actual certification or whatever exam you're taking. Hi, welcome to MedEd's CPN review course. My name is Beth Patton and this module will be respiratory conditions. In this module, we'll list common upper and respiratory and lower airway disorders in children and their diagnosis and management. We'll also be discussing respiratory causes of chest pain in children. First of all, I want to go over what makes kids different. So how are kids different than adults and what makes their airways more difficult or easier to maintain? First, infants are obligatory nose breathers, and that'll be important later when we talk about specific diseases such as bronchiolitis. Until they're about six months of age, they breathe primarily out of their nose. They really don't breathe out of their mouth. And so if the nose is occluded with a lot of mucus or a lot of tubes and devices, it, may, it makes it hard for them to breathe. Also, they have a proportionally larger tongue than adults do. So their tongue becomes an easy airway obstructive issue. So if the t child is somnolent or an altered level of consciousness, it's easy for the tongue to fall back in their mouth and occlude their airway. They have a narrow respiratory lumen, so it takes a lot less to occlude their airway. Something very tiny can occlude an airway, whereas an adult will be able to handle that without a problem. And the narrowest portion of the child's airway is at the cricoid ring. If a child presents with strider, there are a few etiologies that could be a cause of this. We're going to talk about a foreign body, epiglottitis, and viral croup. A foreign body, the typical scenario is, is a sudden onset. The child's well, they're happy, they're playing, and all of a sudden they come present with strider, which is a significant inspiratory noise and increased work of breathing. Always be suspicious of foreign bodies in children who present with an acute onset of any respiratory complaint, but most specifically strider. Epiglottitis is not seen a whole lot more. It, was, um, it used to be it, the primary causative organism is Haemophilus influenza B, which we now vaccinate against but sometimes you will still see it or there'll be an atypical one um, that can cause epiglottitis. These present, children present very ill. They present in a kind of a leaning forward position, a neutral sniff position. They'll be leaning forward trying to keep their airway um, open. And the finding with that you'll see is on a soft tissue neck, the epiglottis will be huge. It'll be like the size of a thumb. It'll cause, cause, cause the thumb sign. Um, these, the airway is a high risk situ situation in patients with epiglottitis. If there's any suspicion a child has epiglottitis, they should be maintained in a position of comfort and um, really quick um, evaluation and intervention with their airway because once they lose the airway, it's a very emergent condition at that point. More commonly, what you'll see is croup. Croup is viral. There's multiple organisms that can cause it. It can be caused by parainfluenza, influenza, measles, and these kids will be much milder symptoms than what you'll see with epiglottitis. They'll come in with mild strider, although sometimes they can be have pretty significant strider. The hallmark thing is a barking cough. It sounds like a seal bark. I tell parents that they have a child, they come in with, with a croup that they'll, once they hear that cough, they'll recognize them in aisle three at the grocery store and a kid in aisle eight can be, have the cough like, oh, I know what that is, that's croup. They'll have rhinorrhea or a runny nose and fever might be low grade, might be pretty high. The symptoms tend to be worse at night, so the child will wake up at two in the morning and have a severe barking, seal-sounding cough. And it sometimes gets better on the way in, so they wake up and they've got this awful cough, and they have strider, they put them in the car, bring them to the hospital. By the time they get to the hospital, the symptoms are much better, and that's because they've been exposed to more cooler ambient air, and sometimes that alone helps alleviate the symptoms a little bit. The treatment, um, so from a patient education standpoint, which is what we as nurses are awesome at doing, things that they can do to help alleviate the symptoms, because it is viral, there's nothing you can do to make it go away, but there are things that you can do to help alleviate the symptoms. So using a humidifier when the baby's sleeping is good. Encouraging liquids, 
Older kids with croup will tell me their throat hurts. Younger kids will act like it hurts because they don't want to swallow or they kind of grimace when they swallow. So I tell parents that liquids are a little bit cooler or will feel good on their throat and maybe it's a little bit soothing. Antipyretics because they do have fever with it. So acetaminophen or ibuprofen for fever control. It's good pain medicine as well. If they have signs of croup, um, this data shows that early steroids help um, decrease the symptoms because steroids are anti-inflammatory, would decrease the swelling and inflammation in their airway. So um, typical steroid that is used is 0.6 uh, milligrams per kilogram of dexamethasone. It can be given by mouth. There are still some people that will give it IM, but there's no reason to give it IM. The bioavailability of steroids by mouth is just as good as it is IM. And if you give an intramuscular injection, the kid gets upset, they cry, and actually their symptoms may briefly become worse. If the child has strider at rest, so they're every time they breathe and they look uncomfortable, then the next treatment would be epinephrine, which can be nebulized, so give them to them as a, as a treatment. The epinephrine vasoconstricts, so it opens up the airway and helps relieve that upper airway obstruction. When parents go home, tell them again, emphasize the cool liquids. If the child develops strider at night or the barking cough becomes much worse, encourage them to um, employ some home interventions at home, which that could be that they take them outside in the cool air. Um, they can open up the freezer door and kind of breathe that cool misty air from the freezer. I tell them just remember to take the kid back out of the freezer. Or some people talk about a warm steamy shower and the mist of that is helpful. I like the cool options better just because it seems more intrinsic to me that something that's cold and vasoconstricts will alleviate the symptoms more than something that's warm, but really whatever works for them. If the child has strider and it's persisting for at least 10 minutes after those home interventions have been employed, then they need to bring the child to the emergency room for further evaluation. Next, I'd like to talk about some lower airway disorders. We'll start with pneumonia. Pneumonia is, and this chest x-ray shows a child with pneumonia, it's a right middle lobe consolidation. So you see how the right part of the lung is very opacified or white. That's suggestive of pneumonia. There are different organisms based on the age and appropriate antibiotics based on what the organism is. As bedside nurses or as staff nurses, we don't necessarily know how to treat it, but just be familiar with the fact that there are different organisms that can cause it based on the age. Young infants can actually get, so less than three months, can get uh, pneumonia actually from chlamydia which would be obviously from vertical transmission from the mother. Older children tend to have um, mycoplasma pneumonia, so that's your late school age or adolescence will have mycoplasma pneumonia. Some people refer to that as walking pneumonia. Um, and uh, strep pneumo is also another organism that can cause it as well. So the antibiotic therapy will be titrated based on what the most common causative organisms are. Lower airway disorders, uh, bronchiolitis, it's very common in children less than 24 months of age. Basically a baby who comes in less than two years of age with a first time wheezer by definition is bronchiolitis. The season tends to be higher or it tends to occur more frequently in the late winter or early spring. The symptoms are coryza, which coryza is a really inflamed nares and, and nasal, clear nasal discharge. A cough, wheezing that might be intermittent and might be persistent. A low grade fever, and difficulty feeding because if you're a baby and you have a lot of nasal congestion and you're wheezing and have increased work of breathing, it's obviously much harder to feed, especially infants who breastfeed or bottle feed. So the treatment for it, it is viral. The organisms that can cause it are respiratory syncytial virus, adenovirus, parainfluenza, and influenza. So antibiotics don't help. Um, there is an immunization or vaccine to help with um, RSV, which is the synergist shot. Um, it is very expensive and there's only certain babies that it's truly medically indicated for and those are kids with complex cardiac um, abnormalities or severe other severe um, syndromes like cystic fibrosis it would also be indicated for. The first line treatment for bronchiolitis is suction and that cannot be emphasized enough. I've had babies that I'll take care of in the emergency room or admit to the hospital that they've been to the pediatrician who gave them some antibiotics and gave them some steroids and gave them a, a breathing machine to help give albuterol nebs and really, and no one ever talked to them about suction in the nose. And steroids don't help, antibiotics don't help, albuterol doesn't help. There's been so much information and data over the management of bronchiolitis and what really helps is suction the baby, um, good deep nasal suction or frequent nasal suctioning advise the parents to do that, especially before the baby takes a uh, bottle. 
and before they lay them down to sleep because then they can sleep better and eat better because they can breathe through their nose. Humidifier helps because it adds moisture to the air, so you have a lot of thick, tenacious secretions. It helps thin those out a little bit and moisturize the air and really encouraging adequate hydration. The typical peak of, from onset to the worst symptoms of bronchiolitis is about three to four days in. And so really watch their PO intake at that point. If they're not able, indications for hospitalization is if either, number one, they require oxygen, um, supplemental oxygen, because they're not able to maintain their stats on their own. Or if they're unable to take adequate PO intake, then certainly they need um, to be admitted to the hospital. And at that point, the best evidence is to drop an NG tube and give them supplemental nutrition until they're able to take a bottle independently again. And this slide shows a picture of a baby with bronchiolitis. Now, ignore the fact that they're getting a breathing treatment. This is a little bit older video. But what I do want you to look at, at the increased work of breathing. This is breathing really hard. You'll see the subcostal retractions, intercostal retractions. And if you look, the baby's actually starting to have some pauses, which shows you this is a baby with imminent respiratory failure um, and really needs to be acted on very quickly. Likely, this is a baby who'll end up being intubated in a very short period of time because of the degree of respiratory failure that you're seeing on this video. Lower airway disorders, asthma. Asthma is characterized by bronchial. There's really three things that occur with asthma. The first is bronchospasm. So the bronchioles constrict and become very tight. Mucosal edema, so there's a lot of inflammation to the bronchioles. And then mucus production. So you really have to, when you're caring for a child with asthma, you really have to address all of these things. There are different types of asthma. There's mild, moderate, and severe. Um, so it's either just mild, every, with seasonal changes, they'll have a little asthma exacerbation, or maybe they're severe, they re, uh, utilize their rescue inhaler very frequently every month and have multiple either unexpected ER visits or hospital admissions secondary to it. The pharmacological management will depend on the severity of the asthma. The two buzzwords to know though is a controller versus a rescue. A controller is a medication the child takes every day to decrease the number of asthma exacerbations or asthma flares that they have. Typically, these are long-acting corticosteroids. Um, usually, they're inhaled um, long-acting corticosteroids, or it might be an anti-inflammatory, or it might be a leukotriene inhibitor, which is singular, um, which is a leukotriene inhibitor or mast cell stabilizer. Um, if a patient's using an inhaled corticosteroid, oral care is important. Ensure they rinse their mouth out really well. Um, and also make sure the family knows that this is something, this is a daily medication. They cannot skip days, they cannot take it as, as needed, they have to take it every day for really it to get its full effect. And I think, I don't think we do enough patient education on that unless you have a robust uh, formal asthma education program. But what I'll tell my patients to do is to just keep it by their sink when they brush their teeth so they can use their inhaler and then brush their teeth afterwards so they get that steroid out of their mouth because otherwise they can have develop some mouth um, irritation secondary to that. And then the rescue drug is their, um, al is their bronchodilator, that's albuterol, provenol, venolin. It's a bronchodilator that opens up the bronchus to alleve alleviate the asthma um, symptoms. Again, make sure they know how to use it I've, and make sure you ask the family what they've been giving at home. Because if they'll say, oh, you know, they've been wheezing and I gave them three treatments today and they're not any better, find out what they put in the treatments. Because sometimes they've been given the controller instead of the rescue. So make sure they know how to use those medications. And then exercise-induced asthma. Um, just know that if a patient, the only time they have bronchospasm or asthma-like symptoms is before exercising. If they utilize the rescue inhaler about 10 to 15 minutes before exercise, that'll minimize the symptoms because by no means should asthma um, interfere with their ability to perform and to be athletic. There's some great Olympic athletes, including um, runners who are severe asthmatics, significant swimmers that are um, severe asthmatics. So you just have to know, take your controllers on a regular basis, use your rescue 10 to 15 minutes before exercise, and that'll greatly decrease those symptoms. So this is a child, a young man, in obvious respiratory distress. You notice that he has significantly labored respirations. Notice he's got supraclavicular and suprasternal retractions, global retractions. He's head bobbing. If you can see his nose, you'd see he's nose, nasal flaring. Most importantly is he'll leaning forward in a tripoding position, which is his, is his position of comfort. 
the ER um, provider tries to get him to lay back, and you can tell that is not comfortable for him. So if they're tripoding and leaning forward, obviously he's in significant respiratory distress and will have a significant asthma action plan, but to keep him in that position of comfort of which he's allowing himself um, to breathe the best. This young lady is also in significant respiratory distress, and I don't know what that contraption is. This is not my video, but it's interesting. Okay. So the classification system for asthma. Um, this is what we refer to as far as when you need to use a controller or not. And I won't go through this in any detail. You won't be tested on it. But there is the mild, persist the mild intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, and severe. And it basically is based on how often the symptoms are present, um, how severe the exacerbation or how long it, uh, what their imp the impact of the exacerbation is, how many nocturnal asthma symptoms they have, and what's the variability on their, their peak flow. The next lower airway disorder I want to talk about is cystic fibrosis. Um, it is an autosomal recessive genetic defect. Um, the signs and symptoms vary. Um, newborn babies, you'll see that they have a very viscid meconium, so that th the meconium is very thick. Sometimes these babies in the uh, newborn nursery will actually um, have come in with symptoms or present with symptoms of a bowel obstruction because that muc meconium is so thick that it obstructs their colon and they actually have to have it flushed out. Older kids will exhibit um, weight loss. So the babies just aren't able to eat enough to really gain weight because they're losing, they're unable to digest the nutrients like they need to. They all certainly have recurrent respiratory infections. As they get older, the stools might become more bulky, more foul smelling, you might even have steatorrhea, which is um, fat and uh, globules in the stool. Persistent wheezing, and um, they used to describe uh, cystic fibrosis as uh, the way you diagnose is, is kissing the babies, and that is that they, because they secrete extra sodium in their sweat, when you kiss their skin, it's actually salty tasting. But remember that cystic fibrosis just makes everything very thick and very tenacious. So because of that, it, it, it plugs up all kinds of stuff. It plugs up the bronchioles, it plugs up the, um, the hepatobiliary tree, so you can have uh, problems with liver digestion and pancreatic digestion. It certainly ob obstructs the GI tract as well. The way it's diagnosed is based on newborn screen. Um, the sweat chloride test is often nonspecific, or um, you'll get the, you might see the words Q and S, which is quantity not sufficient, because little babies don't sweat, so they're not able to produce enough to be able to get an accurate measure from the sweat chloride test. So on the newborn screen, um, they'll show an elevated blood immunoreactive trypsin, or IRT. And then to, the confirmatory test is the sweat chloride test, and greater than 60 millimoles of um, sodium is considered abnormal. Genetic testing certainly for counseling for the family to know what's the likelihood of further family members having cystic fibrosis. They should get a chest x-ray and anytime they come in with a cystic fibrosis exacerbation, get a chest x-ray to see do they have a new infiltrate compared to the, what their baseline chest x-ray looks like. Pulmonary function tests get an idea of what their lung volume is and how healthy their lungs are staying. If they come in with a flare, then a sputum culture to look to see if there's any bacteria growing. I was, the kids with um, cystic fibrosis do tend to be colonized with bacteria, and one that's predominant or one that gets, shows up on tests sometimes is Pseudomonas is a common organism to have, the, have, to have colonized in their sputum. The treatment, if they're having a flare, antibiotic therapy, and certainly antibiotics to keep them from having um, recurrent respiratory infections, sometimes they'll be home on tobramycin. Clearance of pulmonary secretions from a patient family education. This is what our role is, is to um, teach the families. Chest physical therapy to really cl help them clear the sputum. Bronchodilators to help open up the airways, also to help get, uh, clear the sputum. They might be on a mucolytic, which is a medication that helps thin out the mucus or makes it just less, um, less thick or less tenacious. That might be N-acetylcysteine or RHDNase. Um, Anti-inflammatories as controllers long-term to decrease airway edema. Manage with liver disease, because like I said, that uh, the uh, secretions are so tenacious that they'll plug up the hepatobiliary system, and so they might have some pancreatic or hepatic malfunction because of that. They need high calorie diets with added sodium because they have a lot of losses due to cystic fibrosis, and also they're not able to digest um, things as well because of the uh, nature of their illness. So they really need to be on a high calorie diet and increase sodium because obviously they're losing sodium and they need to be on supplemental pancreatic enzymes to help increase their digestion because their pancreas is not able to function fully because of uh, what we've talked about. And then they also need to take supplemental fat-soluble vitamins like um, ADEK or ADEK is a common one. 
So this is a lot. This is a lot for these families to handle. And so close follow-up, close education, support groups, all of those things are so vital to these kids because this is a lifelong disease. Some kids long-term end up with um, lung transplants. There's certainly multiple hospitalizations, multiple medications, and they have to do it every day. They cannot skip a day or their child will have a bad outcome or that patient, once he's an adolescent, will have a bad outcome if they don't manage their disease well. So lots of support. Tuberculosis is caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. The way it's diagnosed is a positive skin test, and I thought this was interesting um, when I was trying to look up the latest data on it. As far as reading the, the TB skin test, you notice that if it's greater than five millimeters in duration, that's considered positive. If they've had contact with an infectious case, have a positive chest x-ray and or are immune compromised. If it's greater than 10 millimeters, it's considered um, positive if it's a high-risk child, again, has been in a high-risk environment, or they've had frequent exposures to TB greater than 15 millimeters, so that's your normal everyday healthy kid or us when we're having our TB skin test prior to an employment, is greater, if they're greater than four years with no risk factors, it has to be 15, greater than 15 millimeters of induration of the wheel of the TB skin test to say it's positive. Classification of tuberculosis, primary infection means that skin test is positive but they have no clinical findings whatsoever, so they have don't have weight loss, they don't have night sweats, they don't have recurrent cough, they just have a positive skin test. That's considered primary infection. Once you have a reactive, once you react to a PPD skin test, you should not have another one. So, um, because it can actually cause significant tissue necrosis. So the, I don't know if you've ever had someone that you work with that just says, I don't get the skin test, I just get a chest x-ray every year. They likely had a positive at one point and so now they should not get another skin test. The actual disease itself may have pulmonary manifestations. Um, or they might have extrapulmonary, which is miliary um, disease that might show up, or they might also have uh, central nervous system uh, manifestations as well. I recently cared for a baby in the hospital that was on ECMO, extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation for months and um, really severe respiratory disease from miliary uh, tuberculosis and is still in the hospital and she's been in the hospital for about six to seven months. Um, and I had never really seen that extent of manifestations of it. But I was like, wow, this is the thing I present on all the time. So it was interesting to have a real case scenario. Certainly taking care of kids with pulmonary TB, but this is the most severe miliary TB I'd ever seen. The treatment, you won't get quizzed on specifics of the treatment, um, but do know that the, if you have an exposure to TB, um, you should take INH. Um, if you have pulmonary tuberculosis, uh, for the first two months, you take INH plus rifampin plus pyrazinamide. Um, for four months, at, then you take INH and rifampin. If it's extrapulmonary TB, then INH and rifampin and um, that medication and a fourth agent. And then 10 months, it's just INH and rifampin. Okay, let's move on to chest pain. Kids come in with chest pain. In fun, just a fun scenario. I've, I've been a nurse for 27 years, worked in the ER forever. And so I've seen, seen a lot, done a lot, heard a lot. So there's no story that ever surprises me. So I had uh, EMS that brought in a 10 year old with chest pain. It was one of our rural EMS units. Um, they don't get a lot of kid calls, very low volume service. And they brought in a 10 year old with chest pain. And they came in, they're like, we put him on oxygen, we gave him an aspirin and we gave him morphine and when here's his EKG. And I said, he's 10. They said, that's our chest pain protocol. I said, do you, do you think they were having a heart attack? And he said, well, no, but that's our protocol. And I said, but anyway, it was just, it was a long story, but basically he was 10, they had chest pain protocol, they had to do all these things and could, were, were unable to filter out the fact that this 10 year old likely was not having a myocardial infarction and did not need that pathway enacted. But sometimes kids do have cardiac causes of um, chest pain, which I won't go into in this module, but basically if you're concerned they're having cardiac causes, certainly get an EKG and a chest X-ray. Causes could be pericarditis or myocarditis, dysrhythmias, or mitral valve prolapse. For this lecture, I'd like to talk about the fact that it could be from respiratory illnesses. Um, pneumonia hurts. Pneumothoraces hurt. Um, so if a child comes in with chest pain and fever, consider that perhaps that it could be from pneumonia. Also, asthma or bronchospasm hurts, and it feels very uncomfortable. I've had kids come in complaining of chest pain and I look and they're retracting pretty significantly and having severe asthma exacerbations. So that was obviously the cause of their chest pain. Costochondritis is when the uh, ribs join the sternum, there's cartilage there. And sometimes that cartilage can get inflamed and irritated and they'll come in complaining of chest pain. 
and they'll actually feel short of breath because when they try to take a deep breath, it stretches out that cartilage and it hurts. So they start splinting because they don't want to take a deep breath. So they'll take more shallow breaths more frequently just be, to keep themselves more comfortable. So they'll feel that they're short of breath and it's just really that. The hallmark finding of costochondritis is that it's repro reproducible. So when you push on the area of the chest where they're complaining of chest pain, that reproduces the pain. The treatment for that is heat, warm compresses or cool compresses, whatever feels better, and then scheduled anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, tell them to take it on a regular basis for a week or two. Um, you'll see this a lot in early adolescence when they've gone through a big growth spurt. Sometimes you'll see it as well when a child has had a recent illness that caused them to be coughing a lot and it just has had that um, either the inter, intercostal muscles are irritated or the, that um, cartilage is irritated. Certainly trauma can cause chest pain, broken chest wall trauma, pneumothoraces, hemothoraces, um, cardiac contusion, seat belt marks, steering wheel marks, and then reflux, uh, gastroesophageal reflux can cause chest pain as well. Okay, so on the test, you might have to interpret a blood gas. And some of you will say, oh my goodness, I'm awesome. I'm so good at blood gases. And some of you will go, oh my goodness, I don't remember how to do that. The good news is that it's very straightforward in the sense that you won't have to do compensated, decompensated, all of those. Um, it'll be more just like it's a straightforward um, blood gas. So I want to talk about that a little bit to try to get you more comfortable. Then I'll encourage you to do some exercises on your own. So first, metabolic acidosis. So your normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So if it's less than 7.35, then that's acid. If it's greater than 7.45, then that's considered alkalosis. So um, the next question you should ask yourself, is this from a respiratory cause or a metabolic cause? So if it's respiratory cause on your ABG, your CO2 will be affected. If it's not respiratory cause, then that your CO2 will be normal. If it's from a metabolic cause, then your HCO3 or your bicarb will be abnormal. Um, so if your CO2 is normal, your CO2 is abnormal, that, or your bicarb is normal, then it's metabolic. So and it's you know, a fairly straightforward, easy way to do. So when you're taking the exam, let me give you a tip when you're trying to do these blood gases, is you can actually strike through some of your answers. So if the question is something that you know is an acidosis, then strike out the two answers that show an elevated pH because you already know that those are not right. So just strike those through and then you can sort out the other two. So I think that's an easy way to do it. Um, so metabolic acidosis, low pH, normal CO2, low bicarb. Um, causes in pediatrics it would be diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. Metabolic alkalosis will be a high pH, a normal CO2, and a high bicarb. What you'll see that with is when vomiting, because you have acid in your stomach. So if you're vomiting stomach acid constantly, then you're going to be alkalotic. And because it's metabolic, then your CO2 will be normal and your bicarb will be elevated. Respiratory acidosis is a low pH, so pH less than 7.35. Your CO2, because it's respiratory, will be elevated and your bicarb will be normal. So think of scenarios for this of when you're hypoventilating. Because when you're hypoventilating, you're, you're accumulating CO2 because you're not blowing it off. So your CO2 will be rising. And in response to that, your pH will drop. So if you think, oh, look, my CO2 is high, then you'd expect your pH to drop accordingly. Scenarios would be pneumonia or over sedation. Respiratory alkalosis occurs when you're blowing off CO2. So you're blowing off your CO2, hyperventilating, so as you blow off your CO2, your pH will rise. So that will cause a respiratory alkalosis. And the scenario for that would be hyperventilation. And that's what I mean by the, the little saying before, the little mnemonic is respiratory opposite or in metabolic equal, which is Rome. So in respiratory, you see your CO2 and your pH, the little arrows are opposite each other. So when the CO2 arrow goes up in respiratory, the pH arrow goes down. Um, but look in metabolic, when your bicarb arrow goes down, your pH arrow goes down as well. So that will kind of help you sort through um, some of it too. So let's go through a couple examples and see how y'all do. Okay, so let's quiz yourselves. pH 7.22, pCO2 55, bicarb is 25. So first of all, your normals. Normal pH 7.35 to 7.45. Normal CO2 is 35 to 45. And normal bicarb is 22 to 26. So your first question, 
is this um, alkalosis or acidosis. Well, your pH is low, so it's an acidosis. So then you look, is it respiratory or, or metabolic? So right now you're gonna strike through any causes of alkalosis in your, in your responses because it's not alkalosis, it's acidosis. Next, your CO2, normal or high or low? It's high. So remember your pH is low, CO2 is high, so that's a respiratory acidosis because those two things are opposite each other. And then you confirm that, look at your bicarb, and your bicarb is normal because it's 25, normal being 22 to 26. So this patient has a respiratory um, acidosis. Now you might say that you might get a uh, blood gas that looks like that, it'll say what's the common cause of that, and you would say hyperventilation, um, I'm sorry, you would say um, the hypoventilation like sedation or pneumonia because they're accumulating CO2 because they're not blowing it off and your pH is dropping. Okay, let's do another one. Y'all did good on that first one. Let's do number two. pH, 7.28. Too high, too low, or normal? It's too low, so it's acidosis. CO2, high, low, or normal? It's normal because it's in that 35 to 45 range. But look at your bicarb, it's way low, 15. So this is a metabolic acidosis because your pH is low and your bicarb is low. So you'll see this with like pyloric stenosis or kids who've been vomiting a lot. This is um, what you would see with that. Let's do another one. pH 7.5. Too high, too low, or normal? So it's high, so it's an alkalosis. So then let's decide if it's respiratory metabolic. Your CO2 is normal, 35. Your bicarb is um, high because it's 33, normal being 22 to uh, 26. So this is a metabolic alkalosis. Good job. And let's do one last one. pH 7.53, PCO2 25, so it's low. Um, bicarb is 22, um, I'm sorry, 26, which is normal. So this is a respiratory alkalosis, which is what you'll see in hyperventilation. Because remember, hyperventilation, you're gonna blow off your CO2, CO2 will go low, so therefore your pH goes opposite, so it'll be high. All right, I hope that helps. Hope it didn't confuse you. Hopefully it can help you figure out blood gases. But just be able to interpret simple like that and then use the strike through when you take the exam and just think of scenarios that might cause that type of abnormality. Okay, so let's do a few more questions. A mother wants her child tested for cystic fibrosis. You state the best test would be A, a chest x-ray, B, pulmonary function test, C, a sweat chloride, or D, a sputum culture. The correct, re correct response is a sweat chloride. That is the, the test, the gold standard, greater than 60 millimoles per liter. It would be considered positive. The other ones are things that you might routinely do if they're having an exacerbation or a flare, but to actually diagnose them, the true, true, the true test is a sweat chloride test. Number two, which of the following is not a treatment for croup? A, steroids, B, antibiotics, C, increased PO fluids or dehumidity? It's gonna be B, antibiotics. I hope all the test questions are this easy for you, because as we know, croup is caused by a virus, therefore antibiotics are not indicated. Number three, which of the following is rarely seen anymore due to the Haemophilus influenza or Hib vaccine? A, epiglottitis, B, croup, C, asthma, or D, strider? And because y'all are smart and paying attention, you know it's epiglottitis, A. All right, thank you all very much for your attention, and this concludes respiratory conditions.